Hello viewers. Good day to all of you. This is Dr. B.K. Paulu and today I will be discussing about axilla. So, in this session we are going to learn axilla under the following headings. So, a brief introduction about the region axilla, the various boundaries of axilla or the walls of axilla. Then we are going to list out the contents of axilla and afterwards we are going to discuss in detail about the axillary artery and vein followed by the description of the axillary lymph nodes and we will end this session with the applied aspects. Okay. Now, when you look at this, you all know this is called as the armpit. So, commonly it is called as the armpit, but in anatomical terms, we call it as the axilla. So, it is actually the space between the medial side of your arm and the lateral wall of the thorax. So, that is your lateral thoracic wall and the proximal part or upper part of the medial side of the arm. It is roughly pyramidal in shape and it has the following boundaries. Apex, base, anterior wall. This is the anterior wall. This is the base which you are able to see here. And in the depth of the hollow you will see the apex. This is the medial wall. This is the lateral wall and this forms the posterior wall. Okay. So here you can see a schematic diagram of the axilla as I told you that it is pyramidal in shape. So it is present between the lateral wall of the axilla and upper part of the medial side of your arm. This is the base of the axilla and the color code is actually given here. This is the medial wall of the axilla. The medial wall of the axilla, the color code you are able to see here, the same formed by the serratus anterior muscle. Posterior wall of the axilla mainly formed by this muscle, that is the subscapularis. Lateral wall of the axilla. It is mainly formed, you are able to see the biceps brachii muscle and this is the apex. The apex as the pyramid, it is not a pointed apex but it is actually truncated or blunt and the apex is actually open to allow the passage of certain structures. So the major vessels and nerves are going to enter into the axilla through this apex. Okay, and then you are able to see also the lateral wall is somewhat narrow or converging as compared to that you are posterior wall and the medial wall. Anterior wall is actually this wall which is open for you and it is given an outline in the pink color what you are able to see which is going to be mainly formed by the pectoral muscles. So now let us understand each and every wall one by one. First, apex. So here you are able to see this small space, narrow space or canal is actually called as the apex and it is also called as the cervico axillary canal. So what do you mean by cervico axillary canal means above this region you have the neck. So here you are entering into the axilla. So it is the passage between your cervix that is your neck region and the axilla that is why it is actually called as the cervico axillary canal which is allowing the passage of the nerves, the yellow color ones and the vessels that is your artery and the vein. If you look at the boundaries of the cervico axillary canal in front it is formed by the posterior border of the clavicle behind by the scapula and medially by the first rib. So that you will understand when we just see a section. So medially by the outer border of the first rib you are able to see here. 
posteriorly by the superior border of the scapula and anteriorly of course you have the clavicle and this area is the cervical axillary canal. So what are the structures passing the cervical axillary canal? You are mainly able to see the axillary artery followed by these three structures they are the parts of the brachial plexus and it is actually surrounded by a sheet of deep fascia which we call it as the axillary sheet. Then if you look at carefully the vein, the vein is actually situated outside the axillary sheet, it is not present. Why? Because usually weight, when it is actually situated inside the axillary sheet, the weight usually what happens? It dilates. If it is present within the facial sheet, then it might interfere with the effective venous return or it might get compressed along with the other structures. So that is why in most of the cases, the weight will be outside the sheet or it will be a more anterior or superficial structure so that it does not get compressed. So I told you what are all is transmitted through this cervical axillary canal. So this axillary sheath as I told you is a prolongation from the cervix, the deep cervical fascia or the deep fascia of the neck because these nerves originate from the neck region. So, when they actually emerge out of the neck and pass to the axilla, they drag along with them the prolongation of the fascia, the axillary fascia, which is in the neck originally is the deep cervical fascia. Coming to the base of the axilla, so here you are able to see the base of the axilla. The base is mainly formed by the skin and superficial fascia that is the fat, so fat is actually a content of superficial fascia and more deep you see this is actually the axillary fascia, okay. So the base extends from your anterior to the posterior axillary fold, I will tell you what is anterior and posterior axillary fold when we see the anterior and the posterior walls and if you look at the base it is somewhat arched or it is a doom shape. Why it is doom shape? The skin is actually somewhat at a higher level or arched because or this axillary fascia is suspended from this fascia. What you see here that is the clavipectoral fascia. This I have already discussed for you in the clavipectoral fascia. That is the clavipectoral fascia forms the suspensory ligament of axilla. So that is why your base is actually raised. So mainly formed the skin, superficial fascia and deep fascia which is the axillary fascia. Don't confuse the axillary fascia with the axillary sheet. The axillary sheet is a prolongation of the deep cervical fascia whereas axillary fascia is the deep fascia which is lining your walls of the axilla and more prominently seen on the base of the axilla. So that is the suspensory ligament for you and which holds the axillary fascia in the base of the axilla. Anterior wall of the axilla here you see mainly it is formed by the pectoral muscles that is the pectoralis major which is covered by the pectoral fascia and deep to the pectoralis major what you see is the pectoralis minor and subclavius. And both again will be covered by the clavipectoral fascia. Okay. Now, the anterior axillary fold, what you see here, is mainly formed by the lower border of the pectoralis major muscle. The lower border, you feel the anterior axillary fold as a round uh, roller margin, round margin. Why? Because even that I have already discussed in the pectoral region that is the lowermost fibers of the pectoralis major what happens is they form a twisted head down. So the fibers actually moves backwards and upwards and forming a twist. So because they are moving backwards and upwards so you get a, a round margin which forms the anterior axillary fold. 
So the anterior axillary fold is formed by the inferior border of the pectoralis major muscle. So where the posterior axillary fold is also formed by two muscles and it is at a slightly lower level than the anterior axillary fold. Posterior wall muscles you are able to see here it is mainly formed by the subscapularis muscle which arises from the subscapular fossa of the scapula. Then you have the teres major and the latissimus dorsi muscle. So both are inserted into you know the teres major is inserted into the medial lip of intertubercular sulcus or also called as bicipital groove. The latissimus dorsi is inserted into the floor of the intertubercular sulcus or the bicipital groove. The lateral lip gives insertion of the pectoralis major. So two majors and one lady. It is called as lady between two majors. So the posterior wall is mainly formed by subscapularis, teres major and latissimus dorsi from above downwards. The posterior axillary fold is mainly formed by the teres major in the upper part and latissimus dorsi in the lower part. Next, coming to the medial wall. So the medial wall is mainly formed by the lateral wall of the thorax. So you get upper four ribs, first, second, third and fourth ribs. Between the ribs these spaces will be filled by the muscles, they are called as the intercostal muscles, more laterally you will see the intercostal muscles. Of course here it is hindered from the view because of one more muscle which is on the lateral wall of the thorax. The serratus anterior muscle, so four to five digitations of serratus anterior muscle. And along the serratus anterior muscle, you can see the nerve circuit also descending along this wall. That is the long thoracic nerve or nerve to serratus anterior. This wall will also be pierced by one more nerve, which is the intercostal brachial nerve. It is called as intercostal brachial nerve. That is the second thoracic nerve, T2 nerve crosses the wall of the axilla and naturally what happens is comes to supply the medial side of the upper part of the arm. So it supplies the thorax wall as well as the arm. So that is why it is actually called as the intercostobrachial nerve. The lateral wall is mainly formed by the long head of biceps. So shaft of the humerus along the long head and supplemented by short head and coracobrachialis. So you are able to see the long end of biceps, along with it what you are able to see here is the short end and upper part the coracobrachialis muscle, all with the shaft of the humerus forms the lateral wall. So this is the medial wall and this is the lateral wall. So medial wall, upper four ribs with the intercostal muscles, upper four to five digitations of serratus anterior with the long thoracic nerve. The intercostal brachial nerve piercing the base of the axilla to come and supply your medial side of the upper part of the arm. Lateral wall is formed by the biceps muscle and coracobrachialis. Posterior wall you are able to see the subscapularis muscle, teres major and latissimus dorsi. Anterior wall is actually open for you which consists of the pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, on top of the skin superficial fascia and the associated deep fish. So what are the contents of axilla? So the axilla, we try to list out the contents of axilla, mainly axillary vessels, that is the axillary artery with its branches, axillary vein and its tributaries, lymph nodes, axillary lymph nodes, so they are actually again subdivided into several groups. So we will be discussing after a few slides about the axillary lymph nodes. Then brachial plexus, cords of the brachial plexus, not only the three cords that is the medial cord, lateral cord and posterior cord of the brachial plexus. Certain nerves also enter the axilla, or branches, long thoracic nerve, uh, thoracodorsal nerve also you see which are two branches of the brachial plexus also enters into the axilla. So again to list out the contents, axillary artery and its branches, axillary vein and its tributaries, axillary lymph nodes and the cords of the brachial plexus. And of course, fat. So fat is actually a loose packing material 
uh, in any place we come across cavity or space so it is a loose packing material which provides mechanical support and also prevents injury to the structures so now we are going to see about the axillary artery in detail so the axillary artery here you are able to see when the arm is at rest it is got a curved course but when the arm is abducted then naturally the course of the artery you can look as a straight it is a branch of subclavian artery and it continues as the brachial artery So it is a branch of subclavian artery and it continues as the brachial artery. The artery is divided into three parts: first part, second part, and third part by the pectoralis minor muscle. Okay. So the pectoralis minor muscle divides the artery into three parts: first part proximal to the muscle, second part behind the muscle, and third part distal to the muscle. The extract of the artery will be from outer border of the first. the lower border of the teres major below the lower border of teres major what happens is it continues as the brachial artery and prior to the first rib it is actually the subclavian artery okay so here you are able to see the whole course of the brachial artery after the pectoralis minor has been removed so all the three parts of the brachial artery you are able to see here and here you are able to see the the brachial plexus arising from the next region so when they come they will bring along with it the deep fascia of the neck that is the investing layer of deep cervical fascia along with it the vessels are actually coming from the thorax and naturally they form the axillary sheath around this there mainly the artery and the nerves but not the vein the vein is not present inside the axillary sheath. Okay, so that is the axillary artery introduction. Now we will go to the relations of the axillary artery. Of the each part, we are going to see about the first part, second part, and third part. So relations. What common relation throughout the course of the axillary artery is the vein will be present medial, or to be more precise, it will be present inferomedial. So axillary vein. is present inferior medial to the artery so that means the medial relation of any part whether it is the first part or second part or third part you can write the axillary vein as its relation in the medial aspect so first part anteriorly the anterior wall of the axilla so you know what all will come pectoralis major skin superficial fascia pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscle all from the anterior wall is the anterior relation for the first part laterally you are able to see this is laterally this is the lateral part and also the posterior part posterior part behind forms the lateral relations then posteriorly here back posteriorly you see the first intercostal space and the medial cord the medial cord you are able to see the medial cord is actually lying behind the artery still it does not come medial okay so anteriorly anterior wall of axilla laterally lateral and posterior cord of brachial plexus posteriorly first intercostal space and medial cord of the brachial plexus relations of the second part very very easy to remember the relations of the second part anteriorly you have the pectoralis minor here which is getting inserted to the corpi process on top of it pectoralis major same as the first part pectoralis major and minor but laterally lateral cord of brachial plexus medially medial cord of brachial plexus and of course you can supplement that with the axillary vein and posteriorly posterior cord of brachial plexus so second part the relations are very easy to remember it is laterally lateral cord of brachial plexus medially medial cord of brachial plexus and posteriorly posterior cord of brachial plexus the cords of brachial plexus itself are actually named as lateral cord medial cord and posterior cord with respect to their relation of these cords 
to the axillary artery. So, because they are present lateral to the lateral cord is present lateral to the second part of axillary artery, medial cord is present medial to the second part of axillary artery, posterior cord is present posterior to the second part of axillary artery, and that is why they are named so. So, second part relations is easy to remember. That is the lateral cord for you, and that is the medial cord for you, and posterior cord, this one which goes behind all. Coming to the relations of the third part of axillary artery. So, third part of axillary artery, anterior relation, here you are able to see one nerve which is crossing. It is actually the lateral root of medial from the lateral cord. Crossing the axillary artery, that is the third part of the axillary artery in the front, to join with the medial root of medial. So, medial nerve, we are able to see that is why it is the form of a M shape. So, all that we are going to discuss later in the brachial plexus class. Okay. So, now here just I am showing you the formation of medial nerve. So mainly, anterior relation for the third part is the crossing of lateral root of medial to join the medial root of median, that will be the anterior relation. Posteriorly, from the posterior cord branches, mainly the two terminal branches on the posterior cord will be the radial nerve and one more branch will be the axillary nerve, which forms the posterior relation of the third part of axillary artery. Laterally, you are able to see the branches of the lateral cord, that is the lateral root of median and the musculocutaneous nerve which is going to supply or pierce the coracobrachial discs. So, laterally, lateral root of median and musculocutaneous nerve. So, there are the branches from the lateral cord. Same way, posteriorly branches from the posterior cord. Two branches we have seen. That is the radial nerve and the axillary nerve. Medially, what you see is the ulnar nerve which is again a branch from medial cord of brachial plexus. Then you also have medial root of median. Then of course other medial relation will be your axillary vein. Then also some other branches from the medial cord comes here, medial cutaneous nerve of arm in the upper part, medial cutaneous nerve of forearm in the lower part. So these are the branches of the third part of axillary artery relations, not the branches, sorry, it is the relations of the third part of axillary artery. Now, coming to the branches of the axillary artery, so far we have seen the extent of the axillary artery, we have seen about the relations of the three parts of the axillary artery, now we have come to the branches of the axillary artery, there are totally six branches of axillary artery, first part only one branch, superior thoracic, second part two branches, acromiothoracic and this is the acromiothoracic or thoracoacromial artery, the other one is the lateral thoracic artery. Third part three branches, subscapular artery, anterior and posterior circumflex humeral artery. So, very easy to remember, first part one branch, second part two branches, third part three branches. And the mnemonic again uses the SAL SAL and SAP SAL, SAL SAL. So, S for superior thoracic, A for acromial thoracic, L for lateral thoracic, SAL. SAP is subscapular artery, anterior circumflex humeral artery, A and P for posterior circumflex humeral artery. Now, we will see in brief about these branches one by one. So, first artery is the superior thoracic artery, which is from the first part, smallest branch, and this mainly supplies your pectoral region and anastomosis with internal thoracic and upper intercostal arteries. Second part, it gives four branches after piercing the clavipectoral fascia. So, structures piercing the clavipectoral fascia, I have already mentioned about this acromial thoracic artery. The four branches you can remember is A, P, C, D. It's from A, B, C, D, you put A, P, C, D, acromial branch, pectoral branch, clavicular branch, and deltoid branch. So, here, we are able to see the branch from the first part of the axillary artery. 
that is the superior thoracic artery which will adjust both with the intercostal arteries and also from the internal thoracic artery. Internal thoracic artery is a branch from the first part of subclavian artery. Then you are able to see the second branch acromiothoracic artery piercing the clavipectoral fascia and dividing into four branches. Clavicular branch supplying your subclavius muscle and acromio clavicular joint and this sternoclavicular joint and uh, of course this is the pectoral branch supplying your pectoral muscles then you have the deltoid branch which is again going to supply the blood supply laterally and also the deltoid muscle and you have the acromial branch which is going to take part with anastomosis around the scapula namely with the transverse cervical, superficial branch of transverse cervical artery. Okay. So, I repeat four branches, acromial, clavicula, deltoid and pectoral. Okay. That is the second branch from the second part of axillary artery. So, the second part of axillary artery has got one more branch that is actually called as the lateral thoracic artery. So, that is actually called as the lateral thoracic artery. Why it is called as lateral thoracic artery? Because it is seen on the lateral wall of the thorax. It runs along the lower border of the pectoralis minor muscle and it is closely related to the anterior axillary group of lymph nodes. So, anterior group of axillary lymph nodes. That is the lateral thoracic artery. The lateral thoracic artery, in case of the females, it is enlarged and supplies the mammary gland and that is why it is also called as lateral mammary artery or lateral mammary branch. Okay, in females, it is enlarged to supply the gland. This is actually called as the lateral thoracic artery. It also, you can see on the lateral thoracic wall runs along with the uh, lateral thoracic nerve of villar nerve to serratus anterior. So now we are moving on to the third part of axillary artery branches, subscapular artery, largest branch of the axillary artery. Okay. So subscapular artery, anastomosis with the lateral thoracic, intercostal and transverse cervical artery and it also gives a branch circumflex scapular artery which passes through the upper triangular space. So here you are able to see the third part of axillary artery which is the subscapular artery, the largest branch. It anastomoses with the transverse cervical artery, intercostal arteries and also a branch from the suprascapular and transverse cervical, deep branch of transverse cervical and suprascapular and that takes place behind the scapula. So, we are going to see that in the later class as the anastomosis around the scapula, vascular anastomosis. Okay. So, that is your subscapular artery. One of the branches of the subscapular artery is the circumflex scapular artery. So, that passes through an intermuscular space which is called as the upper triangular space. So, along the upper triangular space, it passes behind the scapula and it is also going to take part in the anastomosis around the scapula. So that is about the, yes, you are able to see the circumflex scapular artery which is anastomosing with the branches from the subscapular artery. Branches from the transverse cervical, deep branch of transverse cervical which is actually called as the dorsal scapular artery. So, transverse cervical artery, dorsal scapular, circumflex scapular and subscapular artery all anastomosis around the body of the scapula in the supraspinous fossa, in the infraspinous fossa and also around the acromion process. So, that we will be discussing in a separate topic in detail. The last two branches of the axillary artery are the anterior circumflex humeral artery and the posterior circumflex humeral artery. It is called as the circumflex humeral artery because you are able to see here it winds around the surgical neck of humerus. 
So anterior circumflex winds from the front and that also gives an ascending branch which will pass through the intertubercular sulcus. Bicipital groove. Posterior circumflex humeral artery passes behind by passing through another intramuscular space which is actually called as the quadrangular space. So through this quadrangular space, the posterior circumflex artery will enter along with the axillary nerve and again it gives a descending branch. The posterior circumflex artery descending branch. This also takes place anastomosis around the scapula. So, we have seen about the six branches of the axillary artery in detail. One is the first branch is the superior thoracic, second branch is the acromiothoracic, third branch is the lateral thoracic, fourth branch is the subscapular artery, fifth branch is the anterior circumflex humeral artery, and sixth branch is the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Artery. Okay, so axillary artery, we can expect it as an essay yes, question. Then we have to describe about its the extent. We have to discuss about the relations of the three parts, and uh, then you have to describe in brief about these branches of the axillary artery. So now coming to the next uh, axillary artery, it is accompanied by the axillary vein. It is present medial to the axillary artery or intromedial to the axillary artery outside the axillary sheath. So here we are able to see mainly three ways confluence the formation of axillary vein. One is the basilic vein, so which continues above at the axillary vein. The axillary vein itself extends same as the artery only, outer border of first rib to the lower border of teres major. Beyond the outer border of first rib, it continues as the subclavian vein. So, I told you three veins. One is the basilic vein, another one is the venae capitans of the brachial vein. So, three veins confluence. Here, brachial vein is known as a single vein, but actually it is present in the form of venae capitans. Venae capitans means a pair of veins running along with the artery or either side of the artery. Why it runs as a venae capitans is because the pulsations of the artery aids in the venous return because veins does not have muscle, so that is why it cannot contract effectively. So, continuation of glazeric vein and continuous as subclavian vein joined the venae capitans of brachial artery and one more this is the basilic vein, it continues. The cephalic vein from the lateral aspect, then what happens is comes and joins at a later stage which is again a tributary of the axillary vein. Okay. So, tributary of axillary vein is cephalic vein. Venae capitans of brachial vein also can be considered as formative tributaries. So, as I told you, it is present medial to axillary artery. So, it is seen intromedial to the axillary artery, the axillary vein. So, cephalic vein I told you and of course, the corresponding branches of the axillary artery lateral thoracic vein, superior thoracic vein, acromiothoracic vein and so on, anterior posterior circumflex veins. Okay, now we are moving to the next aspect of our lecture, axillary lymph nodes. So, you know very well why a knowledge of the lymph nodes is very, very essential because of the spread of infections, not only that metastasis secondary spread or deposits of cancer to the distant places also takes place through this lymphatics and the lymph nodes. And axillary lymph nodes again gains importance because they are mainly involved in the carcinoma of the breast. Now, around this group of lymph nodes, are 20 to 30 in number, you know very well lymph nodes are most commonly associated with the blood vessels or sometimes they are deposited within the substance of the fat. They go unnoticed in your dissection, only when it is enlarged then you can, you will be able to distinguish from the fat, it looks separate from the fat, that is one thing. Same way if you want to actually visualize your lymph vessels to radiograph, then you should go for a lymph angiogram, again a specific procedure. 
So, mainly the axillary root nodes, what all they drain? The pore of the upper limb, your mammary gland, then your wall, anterior thoracic and abdominal wall up to the level of umbilicus. Below the level of umbilicus, the wall is actually drained by the inguinal lymph nodes. Okay. So, above the level of umbilicus, again I remember, I am, again I actually remind you, it is the wall, superficial structures, not the deep abdominal cavity. Only the wall, skin superficial fascia and the muscular wall, the lymphatic surface is actually drained by the axillary group of lymph nodes. Then the mammary gland is drained by the axillary group of lymph nodes. And again your back up to the level of iliac crest. Again your posterior wall only, not the deeper structures. So this is the area of drainage of axillary lymph nodes. So five groups are present. Anterior group you have, posterior group you have, lateral group you have, central and finally what happens, what you have is the apical group. Anterior group, posterior group, lateral group, central group and the apical group of lymph nodes, the axilla. So, axillary lymph nodes have these five subdivisions. Axillary group, uh, anterior group is again can be referred as uh, pectoral group of lymph nodes and posterior subscapula because they are actually seen on the posterior wall of the axilla. So, here you are able to see the anterior group of lymph nodes. So, the anterior group of lymph nodes mainly present along the lateral thoracic vein and collects lymph mostly from the breast. Okay, so lymphatic drainage of breast we have already discussed about the superficial lymphatics as well as the deep lymphatics. So, mainly collects from the breast. Then from there it drains to the central and from there it goes to the apical group of lymph nodes. So, mainly what happens is carcinoma of the breast, especially it is anterior group of lymph nodes, the axillary tail of spines, if at all present, will be closely related to this. So, if carcinoma of breast is involved, then naturally when you palpate at this place, you are actually palpating the breast tumor, but you think it is just a lymph node enlargement. So, mostly misdiagnosed as an enlarged lymph node and you wait for some time, maybe a normal infection, then the lymph node enlargement might resolve itself. Okay? So that is why what happens is when you are going to palpate the uh, any mass, very stony, hard in nature, so always you should keep in mind, you should actually rule out the carcinoma of the breast and not simply diagnose it as an enlarged lymph node, anterior group of lymph nodes. Posterior group of lymph nodes are subscapular lymph nodes seen along the posterior wall of the axilla. They mainly drain your, I told you, the posterior wall, your back up to the level of iliac crest. And if runs from there, go to the central group and from there they go to the apical group. The next, what you see is the lateral group of lymph nodes present along the axillary vein. The lateral group of lymph nodes. Also called as humeral group of lymph nodes. These lymph nodes mainly drain your whole of the lymph except along the cephalic vein. Because cephalic vein, those lymphatics will carry along and they may go to delta pectoral nodes. In the delta pectoral group, not only cephalic vein, some lymph nodes also can be encountered, they are actually called as the deltopectoral nodes. So, lateral part of the limb, cephalic vein, whereas the remaining part of the limb, it actually drains into the lateral group. Okay. What actually lymph node is also present medially above the trochlea of humerus, it is also called as supratrochlear nodes. Then, we come to the central group of lymph nodes. Here you are able to see the central group of lymph nodes present along the base of the axilla. So, within the substance you are able to see. It receives lymph from the anterior, posterior, lateral and from there it goes to the apical group of lymph nodes. 
Now again, when you are going to palpate the central group of lymph nodes or apical group of lymph nodes, what you should do is, one hand you push through the base of the axilla, the other hand you push behind the clavicle and then you try to palpate because since it is present at a deeper plane, so that is how actually you palpate the central group of lymph nodes, whether they are involved or not. And of course, mainly you will be checking this when you are suspecting the carcinoma of the breast. So, from the central group of lymph nodes, they go to the apical group. So, here you are able to see the apical nodes. So, it receives the lymph from all the other groups, central, lateral, anterior, posterior. And from there, what happens is they form a subclavian lymph trunk. And it will drain by two methods. If it is left side, here left side is not shown, it drains into the largest lymphatic duct, the thoracic duct. Whereas on the right side, it drains into the jugular lymph trunk, right jugular lymph trunk, which is present at the junction of the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein. So there they go and drain. And apical group, not only from all these, they also receive some lymphatics directly from the upper part of the mammary gland. One more thing, with respect to the central group of lymph nodes, I told you the intracostal brachial nerve, that is the second T2 spinal nerve, the ventral primary ramming is going to cross the base of the axilla, passes through the axilla and comes to the arm to supply the medial side. So on its way, again the lymph nodes are present. If the lymph node is enlarged, then it might compress this nerve and you might feel referred pain over the medial side of the upper part of your arm. So, pain over the medial side of upper part of arm might be due to the irritation or compression of the intercostal brachial nerve due to an enlarged lymph node exerting pressure over it. So, coming to the Applied aspects, so most commonly you are able to see here is the lymph node enlargement, the infections of the lymph or on the carcinoma of the breast. So metastasis from the breast, naturally the lymph nodes will get involved. Okay. What is rotor's nodes? Now, I have told you regarding the axillary lymph nodes into central group, posterior group, anterior group, lateral group and apical group of lymph nodes. Now, clinically what happens is they have found out with respect to the pectoralis minor muscle, above the upper border of muscle you have the upper group of lymph nodes, then behind the muscle you have the middle group of lymph nodes, then below the muscle you have the lower group of lymph nodes, first or second or third group they call it as and one more group is the rotor's nodes which is present between the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. This is one more type of classification of the lymph nodes which you can find it in some of the textbooks. Then you know axilla consists definitely hair, secondary mostly after puberty axillary hair is present the secondary sexual characters. So infection of the hair follicles and sebaceous gland might form cysts sebaceous cysts, more common, cold abscess. So what is a cold abscess? Cold abscess is mainly because of the tuberculosis of the bone. So tuberculosis means don't necessarily it should be of the lung, it may even affect all the organs. So naturally when it affects the bone usually not symptomatic like you don't have the classical symptoms of uh, persistent cough, blood stain to sputum and all those things. So cold abscess from your cervical vertebra, what happens is that abscess may track along with the nerves of the brachial plexus through the axillary sheath and they might come and point here in the axilla. So that is one reason when you find an abscess, so before draining an abscess, this also you should keep in mind, it is, you should rule out whether it is not a cold abscess. So the pus of the abscess or separation might pinpoint anywhere along the anterior axillary fold. Okay. So infections of the hair follicles or sebaceous glands are more common in the axilla because a lot of sweat is there. So chance of inspection is there. And second thing is involvement of the axillary lymph nodes when they are enlarged mainly due to the infections of the upper lip or 
metastasis from the breast. Okay, so that is all about the axillary lymph nodes. So here you are able to see the abscess which is mainly formed here or separations. axillary arch the next one is the axillary arch so here you are able to see a separate slip of muscle from the latissimus dorsi so from the latissimus dorsi to the pectoralis major both are present on the two lips now in between that you can see a, an additional slip might be an additional origin or insertion because the latissimus dorsi is originally a muscle of the upper limb which has migrated backwards this is actually called as the ligament of struthers axillary arch now when this is present sometimes it might compress your axillary vein and it might lead to venous thrombosis okay so thrombosis of vein because this extra slip or axillary arch might compress your axillary vein and it might form venous thrombosis so today we have discussed about the axillary region in detail. We have seen about the boundaries of the axilla. That is, the each wall of the axilla, whether apex, base, anterior wall, posterior wall, medial wall, and lateral wall. Contents of the axilla. On that, we have seen about the axillary artery in detail. The branches of the axillary artery. Then we have seen about a brief description about the axillary vein and. Finally, we have seen in detail about the axillary group of lymph nodes. So, axilla again can be explained, can be expected as an essay question. You have to discuss about the boundaries of the axilla, but we need not discuss about axillary artery in detail. Axillary artery asked as an essay question, then you can discuss in detail. Axillary lymph nodes may again be actually asked as a separate short note. So, thank you very much for patient listening. We will again meet in some other lecture.